Um, thank you all for giving me some flexibility. Katie and I are out near Denver, Colorado, visiting our son, daughter-in-law, and our granddaughter, our four-month-old granddaughter. So um, it is 48 degrees here at 8,500 feet elevation. And it's supposed to only be a high of um, 62 today. So um, we're, we're in uh, an elevation where it's a lot more uh, seasonally uh, <laughs> comfortable than it is when it's 90 degrees down there. Um, so it's 7 o'clock in the morning here, and uh, we can't see the sun yet because it's overcast. So thanks again for letting us be flexible enough to be with you via Zoom today. So our Sunday school lesson is in keeping with Pastor Larry's sermon title, uh, Keeping in Step with the Spirit from the book of Galatians. So if you turn to Galatians, we are in chapter five. Now, before we get there, just a couple of things I want to draw your attention to. Uh, Paul is the author of Galatians. He's writing to the church of Galatia, which would be... Uh, fairly near modern-day Turkey. Uh, Paul is trying to make sure they understand that when they talk about freedom, when we talk about freedom in Christ, we're not talking about freedom to do whatever we want, but we're talking about the opportunity to have freedom from sin. And it is a distinction that needs to be made because there are still many people today that this is applicable to where we believe that because we um, have become Christians or that we uh, have faith, that there's nothing that we can't do because God will forgive us for all of that. And while that is a true statement, there is difficulty in that. And today we want to flesh that out a little bit. And Pastor Larry, I believe, is, uh, is put us on to a good topic today. So, as Steve Ginn reads for us, I want you to, to listen carefully because Paul is taking us from um, what is considered sin and a life of sin to a life of, of faith and a life of peace. Mr. Ginn, are you ready? I'm ready. Go ahead, please. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not be unconceited, provoking, and envying each other. Thank you, Steve. So as you look at your outline, I want to take you through a little bit of a pathway of where Paul is taking us. Now, um, Paul has a writing style. It's called Pauline writing style. And, and Paul's writing style is often where he will... Um, he'll give you what some people are talking about, and apparently in the Church of Galatia, uh, there are people who are saying, you have freedom in Christ. You have freedom to do whatever you want, anything that you want at all, because you've been made free in Christ. And so he's trying to help them to understand that that freedom has a definition that's different from the world. It's, it's a definition that's created by God himself.
So look at verse 13 there because it's a directional difference. And that's what I put into your outline. It's a directional difference. So in 13, he says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. You notice the directional difference. So we have choices that we have to make. Um, one Christian guy who's been a mentor to me a long, a long time, he used to say it this way. He said, I can choose each day which direction I choose to go or want to go. I can go this direction or I can go this direction. And when I go this direction, I'm going away from God. When I go this direction, I'm going toward God. So look at the directional difference. We have an opportunity in verse 13 to indulge the flesh. In other words, do what we want to do or serve one another humbly in love. So you notice the difference. We can do what most people do in their lives. They do whatever they desire to do. They do what they want to do or we can do what God calls us to do, and that is serve one another. And look how he says it, serve one another humbly in love. And that is a, that's a mindset. And if you can look at this part of Galatians with that entire mindset, it will help you understand where Paul's trying to take us. So, so with that in mind, on your outline, I write, how might this be relevant to you? How might this be relevant to you? So think about your day. When you wake up, what begins to, to cross your mind? What begins to, to percolate in your mind? And for some of you, it's I've got to get that cup of coffee or else. Uh, but for others of you, you've begun to think, this is what I want to do today. This is what my goals are. Um, for me, it's a list, uh, usually on a white piece of paper or a yellow uh, pad, and it's a list because I'm a checklist guy. And so um, I begin to develop that mental checklist on, on what I want to do. But how might this be relevant to you as you face each day? Do you want to indulge what you want to do, or do you want to serve? And that's a question that you probably have to face every day. Pat Hyland, I see that you've already been struck by your wife. So <laughs> it <hurt>. <laughs> well, sorry that I can't defend you. I'm, I'm uh, 1,700 miles away. So as you think about how it might be relevant to you, how might this also be relevant to the United States? So if you look at it, uh, this past week has been some landmark decisions by the Supreme Court. We also recognize that um, I read an article recently. You may be familiar with the concept of tipping point. Um, tipping point is basically a, a modern day context on, on some old philosophy of once society gets to a certain place, um, it can't do anything but kind of tip over. Uh, you may be that way. If you've been over before and you start to lose your balance, it's very slow at first, but then all of a sudden you lose your balance completely and you fall down. That's the concept of tipping point. Um, we are at a place where United States citizens have to decide, are we going to do whatever we want to do? Or are we going to serve mankind? Are we going to help others? And that is a point that every society struggles with. Historically, every society has struggled with that. Those that are still in existence and those that have fallen away, those that are in the process of growing and those that are in the process of dying. And so um, I think that Paul's comment here still is applicable even to a society such as the United States. Now, the third point that I want you to think about today when we talk about directional differences, do we do whatever we want or do we serve others? How might this comment be relevant to churches? Anybody have any thoughts? Go ahead. Steve, go ahead. 
I'll go. Okay. Well, um, I was looking at a pie chart of the United Methodist Church this morning, and 44% of the church identifies as traditionalist. That's 30% um, moderate, tiny little percent progressive, and then a little bit bigger percent was unsure. And I think those who preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and follow the Bible, which I take to be the traditionalist, um, are in contention with the progressives. And it behooves us, it behooves the traditionalists to try to influence the moderates and the unsure as to where they stand. Are they following the gospel of Jesus Christ or are they following the gospel of our culture? You know, Kathleen, um, I think the the last comment that you made certainly resonates with me. Are we following the gospel of Christ or the gospel of the culture? Remember, um, you've probably heard me say this before, and you'll you'll get tired of hearing me say it in the future because it's it it needs to be a comment that's said a lot, and that is that um, where do we base our truth on? What do we base our truth on? And for society, remember that um, there's this concept of relativism where uh, people believe that truth is somewhat a moving target or it's relative to the circumstances or the situation. Um, if you have remember back, some of you who had children, really young children, and you caught them doing something they weren't supposed to be doing, and you asked them what they had done, they have a tendency to bend reality or bend truth because it best meets their needs at that moment. And we recognize that when they do that, we have caught them. Some of you would say we have caught them embellishing. We have caught them in a lie. We have caught them veering away from truth. What I hope today uh, that, that you think about is that how might this be relevant to churches today? Directional differences. Um, do we indulge the flesh? Another way to say that is, do we indulge what culture thinks is important? Or do we serve the one who died for us? Do we serve the one who is truth? And if we go back and always focus on what is truth, not the way we feel, um, not the way we would like it to be, but what is truth? Um, there's some hard realities in life. Um, the law of gravity is one. If you go to clean your gutters this afternoon and you lean too far over on a ladder and that ladder falls, the truth is gravity always wins, right? Gravity always is the way it works. And so you fall off the ladder and you get hurt. And so you may say to yourself, I wish that I hadn't fallen off the ladder. And that's a true statement, right? But the reality is, is that truth, gravity is there. And we're victims of gravity. We are subjected to, to gravity. So how might this be relevant to churches? Um, as Kathleen said, you know, we, we have a tendency to, to have to think and make a decision every day. Who am I going to follow? What do I choose to claim as truth? What will be truth for me? And if I base my truth on what I read in the news, it changes over time. It moves. It doesn't stay the same. Because people are not always going to stay the same. Their attitudes change, um, their mindset reflects, their education changes, their experiences move. And so um, we have a tendency as human beings to wake up in the morning and say, hmm, 
this is what I feel today versus this is what I choose to follow today. So that's an important point on verse 13. Ver verse 14, um, you know, we, we hear this, uh, for the entire law was fulfilled in keeping in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. And he's really going back to, um, uh, let me turn there for you, to Matthew 22. And it's the story, if you remember, when Jesus is approached by some religious leaders and they ask him, um, you know, what's the greatest commandment? So in 22, 34, and 40, let me read it for you. Um, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, what is the, which is the greatest command in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now listen to what he says. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And the reason Jesus says all the law and the prophets, that was the entire Torah. It was the entire um, Talmud that, that the, the people of that day had. It was their Bible, okay? It was the, all of the first five books of the Bible, plus a number of other books that we now have put into the Old Testament. So Jesus is, tell, is telling them that um, these, these two commands that you call the greatest command, they're the essence of our faith. They're, they're what we kind of strive to become as people of faith, and, and that's where God wants us. So when we see this again, the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this command, love your neighbor as yourself. And um, that's a good one. That's a good one to rest on. And it's one that you may want to commit to memory. That might become uh, one of your life verses for you uh, because it, it does really synthesize a lot of what we try to understand about Scripture and about the life of Jesus and why he came into the world and why he died on the cross for us. Uh, there's a lot of philosophy that can go in that, a lot of theology that can go in and out of that context. But at the end of the day, it's pretty essential to our faith. Now let's look at verse 15. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So obviously a warning, but what's the meaning? What's the meaning? Barb Salyer, comment? <laughs> no comment from Barb? Okay. <laughs> All that is self-destructing. Yeah, that, that sounded like Ken. Um, tear down instead of build up. Say that one more time, Barb. You're going to tear down instead of build up each other. Yeah, it, uh, it also, unfortunately, is what's happening in the modern church. Um, and when I say the modern church, I'm not just talking Round Hill United Methodist. You could look at what Kathleen was talking about in Methodism, but you can go to any Protestant denomination. You can go to any organized religion because... Who's involved in organized religion? People, right? And as a result of that, um, we have a tendency, if we're not careful, to begin to devour one another. And all of a sudden, our, our attention kind of turns inward. And when our attention turns inward, it becomes very human nature oriented. And, and by that, I mean... We have a tendency then to, to dig a trench, and we don't want anybody crossing into our side of the, on the other side of the trench where we are, or vice versa. And so we begin to draw boundaries and, and battle lines. And, and so um, this becomes an important part of Scripture for us to understand as we think futuristically about what the church means and what it stands for and what your individual belief is and what you stand for 
again, we go back to the beginning of this part of, of the lesson that Pastor Larry put us to, and that is when you wake up in the morning, who do you choose to be? Do you choose to be someone who chases after only what's important to you, or do you choose to serve others? All right, look at verses 16 through 18. Um, this is Paul again writing, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So why is Paul writing this? Why is he writing it then? And why would he write it today? Well, the law became extinct more or less for us to follow once Jesus Christ died on the cross for us. And he's trying to get that across to him, that we live by the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ's law, not the law. Well, well said, well said, Beverly, well said. Um, so remember that that still, even today, uh, all religions have laws, rules, um, standard ways of doing things. Um, sociologists would call it mores. It's it's kind of a, the social mores that that happen where we. We just feel that, okay, I'm, I have to be within these lines. I have to be within these boundaries to fit into um, this organized group of people. And we would call that a church, right? And so uh, we have some common beliefs as to why we're comfortable worshiping with each other or being in the same room with each other. Um, it doesn't mean that we all believe if we write out 100 beliefs, each of us individually write out 100 individual beliefs, and we have that in front of us, and then we went around this classroom, just this classroom that you're in right now, and we said, okay, um, these are the most common beliefs that we have. So I don't know what the percentage would be. Let's make it up. There's probably 60 or 70 common beliefs that everybody in this room would have and share. Out of 100, we probably would share 60 or 70. Very common, right? But then we begin to get into some other beliefs. And, and for some of you, those beliefs would say, um, you know, I, I don't agree with that, but it doesn't get in the way of relationship with that person. But then some of us may have on our list of 100 beliefs, we may have something on that list that others in the room would say, wait a minute, I, I can't be in relationship with that person because that is so against my core values and beliefs. And as people of faith, often our faith will take us in directions that are really not scripturally based, but rather they become something that we feel something that we believe, something that we recognize in our world is important, and we would call it a belief. Now, on my list of 100, there may be a few things there that I write as a belief, and you would say, that's not a belief for me. That's, uh, that's, that's a theory. Uh, that's a fallacy. It's a myth. It's, it's, uh, it doesn't apply to my life. But I may say, that's a core belief for me. So we can't be in relationship if we're not together on this core belief. And Paul is trying to get the early church in Galatia to understand that we have to choose. He says, for you'll not, so I say walk by the flesh or walk by the spirit. As, as Beverly says, that's God's Holy Spirit. Remember, when we become people of faith, God's spirit is automatically placed inside of us. Um, it's been said, and, and this is what you usually don't hear, but it is true. It's the very spirit of Jesus Christ who is in you, right? It's God's Holy Spirit. The triune God is 
in each of us now as people of faith. And as a result, Paul's saying, be led by that spirit of God. Don't be led by your spirit of the flesh because they're in conflict with each other. We're in conflict because we want what we want. We're in conflict because Adam and Eve chose not to follow God and chose to follow their own personal desires. And that's where sin started, right? That's the, the beginning of sin. But in verse 18, I want you to notice this. He says, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Important concept. It's not as important for us as it is for a Jew in the day of, of Paul because they had so many laws that they had, it had been pounded into them. It had been for centuries. They had misunderstood what God's commands were, but they, they, they developed this humanistic approach to you have to do these things in order to be accepted by God. That's one of the main reasons Jesus came into the world is to make, help them to understand and see, look, you've made up all these laws. That's not what is about relationship. Instead, you've made things, the, one, the list of 100 beliefs, and that's why he goes back and says earlier, um, the entire law is, is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. So he's trying to get us back to understand this is what God really intended in all that and not all these other laws of you can only walk so many feet on the Sabbath and, and you can feed this animal on the Sabbath, but you can't feed this animal. Um, you can't cook on the Sabbath, but you can do this on the Sabbath. And, and you see, if we become people of rules and regulations, it takes us away from the meaning of why Jesus died on the cross. All right, let's keep moving. Verses 19 through 21, um, <clears throat> he goes into some acts of the flesh, right? And, and he says they're obvious. Now, some of these um, are not in our modern syntax today. Um, we don't really think too much in terms of some of these words that Paul uses, but they were evident in those days. So you could substitute words if you wanted to. But I would implore you in your own time, we won't have time today, to recognize that all these words still fit today's language. Even though we often say when this lesson is taught that this is old language, but today it still occurs, it still happens it's just we don't use this language necessarily today. Um, so he talks about sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, um, you know, which is kind of wild living, kind of doing what, it, it, what feels good. That's what that kind of means. Um, idolatry. Um, you know, in Paul's day, um, he was in Galatia when he wrote this letter, was a very polytheistic. Poly meaning many, many gods, right? And Today, uh, I would submit to you that uh, idolatry is still very much prevalent. Um, you know, um, don't mean to be condemning, but maybe you sat in church today and thought about, I'd really like to have a new car. That's idolatry, right? Um, when we begin to place other things over our thoughts about God, that is the definition of idolatry. Now, as we're all guilty of some of this, I want you to appreciate Paul simply saying, these are the things that interfere with relationship with God. All right? These are the things that interfere. Uh, and he goes on, witchcraft, uh, hatred. Okay? Boy, if you don't see that in, in your world or my world or our world, then we've missed it. Discord. Um, we don't really use the term discord. We might say division. Um, we might say tension today, uh, but it's there. Uh, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions. Um, you know, the very quote that Kathleen gave us earlier about traditionalist 
moderates, progressives, the undecided, uh, you know, that to, to a great degree is factions, um, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. But here's what's interesting, and I want you to hear this. Um, he says, I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So how might you say that in words today and in, in your own language when he uses the terms not everyone inherits the kingdom of God? What's, what, do you, what do you hear there? I think what he's trying to say is the kingdom of God is within Say it one more time for me, Pat. What he's saying is the kingdom of God is within all of us. Now, whether or not we choose to live by what's within or respond to what, with, what is without, that's the kingdom. And that's the, the deviation from the fan. Okay. But first, we also have to accept Jesus Christ in our life for those that choose to live by the sin some of them are afraid to accept Jesus Christ because they're afraid they can't give up the sins of their human nature and they're just going to fall by, by the wayside they're not going to have you know life with Jesus Christ in eternity they have to make a choice good <clears throat> anybody else there's another way that, that I want you to really see this today that I believe is, is Paul's central concept. And, and um, unfortunately, I can't be with you in person because as a teacher, one of the things that I value is reading body language. And um, I really can only see a few of you. Um, I can see Stoney Croson clearly in the center of my picture. So I'll be able to read his body language. Uh, I can read Pat's body language. And I, can, I can read when Susie smacks him so I know when he's out of line. But otherwise, it's a little limited what I can see. So what I'm going to say to you, um, it's going to sound harsh and judgmental. But I don't want you to miss the point of what Paul is saying. He is saying that if people choose to live with those descriptors in their life, they will not go to heaven. They will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. So Paul is saying, and he wants the reader to understand, that there are consequences to our choices and our behaviors. Now, in a moment, we're going to talk about condemnation versus conviction. So I need you to not shut down your minds for a few minutes as we talk about this, okay? Because, look, there is hope here. So <laughs> I know it doesn't, but if you happen to be sitting there in the sound of my voice and you recognize that uh, uh, the, the acts of the flesh that are obvious that Paul read off, and let's say that four or five or six of those are prevalent in your life and you're thinking, Doug Rinker just said that I'm going to hell. Um, I want you to hear instead what Paul would say again. And he says it in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. If you want to write this down, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. I'm going to read it to you so, so you don't miss it, okay? Um, or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? That's what Paul says again. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now listen, this is important. And that is what some of you were. You hear the past tense? So Paul's saying, before you came to understand that Jesus is the Christ, that he died on the cross for you, some of us lived this way. That's what we were. That was their titles that people would put to our name. And that was what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. 
So you hear what he's saying. He's saying that, look, you may have been that way, but you don't have to stay that way. You may have been someone who was, um, as some preachers would, would, would preach fire and brimstone, you were headed to hell in a handbasket, but that doesn't define who you are today. In other words, when we are people who have sinned, we don't have to have that to be our only name. We don't have to have the name sinner. We don't have to be um, without hope. And that's why Paul says, and that's what some of you were. And when we become people of faith and Christians, it doesn't mean that we stop sinning entirely. It means that we have the hope in Christ, that we have a choice that we can make to stay as sinners or to seek out that perfect love that God gives us to love our neighbor as ourselves and to love the Lord, our God with all of our heart or soul, strength and mind. So I, I want you to say and understand that with me. So I wrote on your outline this. So is it one and done? In other words, do I sin once and there is no hope for me? And the answer to that is no. But the answer also that Paul gives us is that we are called to a new life. So if you look at what Paul says in 19 through 21 and, um, you know, uh, impurity, sexual immorality, immorality, uh, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, factions, envy, um, you know, any of those things that may sometimes define the way you are. They may define your behaviors from time to time. It doesn't mean that you have to stay that way. It, it doesn't mean that, that that's your only hope. It, it doesn't mean that you can't be a person of faith. Now, with that in mind, um, and I've lost you on my screen. Are you still there? Yeah, we're still here, Doug. Okay, good. I got you back. Thank you. Um, now, now the important part that I don't want you to miss, and here it is. It's on your, it's on your um, individual sheets. Condemnation versus conviction. Here's how I described it to a group of young men that, that I'm um, in Bible study with, and, and that is this. Um, if you feel condemned, then that is not of God. If you feel convicted, that is of God. So if you ever feel like you are worthless and hopeless and you're no good, that is not an opinion of God. Otherwise, he wouldn't have sent Jesus to die for us. He would have just wiped out the whole world again, right? So if you feel condemned, I would tell you that is the spirit of, of the Antichrist. That is the spirit of the devil. If you feel convicted, that's God's way of the spirit in you saying, I want you to do better. I want you to do differently. But if you ever feel condemned, hopeless, and helpless, that is not of God. And you need to be clear with that in your faith. If, if I or anyone else in the church ever make you feel that way, I'm sorry, because that's not what you should hear. Now, if you say, wow, I, I think I just heard that I need to get my act together. I need to repent. I need to ask God's forgiveness. I need to ask so-and-so's forgiveness. Then that's what I hope you hear, because condemnation is not of God. Conviction is of God. The power of the Holy Spirit in your life is to help you recognize wrong and to change. The power of Satan in the world is to make you feel hopeless and helpless and no good. That you are worth less. If you feel that way, that's of Satan. That's not of God. And so that's why I wanted to read 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, because that's when Paul gives that great line of, and that is what some of you were. All of us 
were titled as sinners with no hope before Christ. But once Christ comes into our lives, we may still be sinners, but we have hope. And that hope is in the person of Jesus Christ. And we can never forget that. Now we got to move quickly. Verses 22 through 23. um, You know, this is where Paul then starts talking about what is the fruit of the spirit of God. So uh, sometimes people will say, I don't feel that there is, I don't feel God's spirit in my life. And I would say that if you have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, if you have any of those in any level of aspect in your life, then I believe that God's spirit is working in you. Now, maybe you're suppressing God's spirit a little bit. Maybe, maybe you're indulging your flesh and it's getting in the way a little bit of God working. But those are the behaviors of God's spirit in your life. And it's the desired results of our faith and guidance by God's Holy Spirit. Now, in verse 24, he goes on and says, those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passion and desires. Crucified the flesh. Uh, There's some modern contemporary worship songs about crucifying the flesh. Um, One way for you to look at this is sometimes if there is a sin in your life that seems to control you. Um, You might call it an addiction. Um, It may be a habit. It may be a, um, a trait that you have, you have practiced maybe not even deliberately, just very um, innocently at times. It has now become a normal routine for you. Um, One way to look at this is this concept of crucifying the flesh is, um, and I've heard it said before, it's basically you take whatever that is and you deliberately nail it to the cross yourself. So you crucify whatever that is. In other words, I'm going to, I'm going to put this to death. I'm, I'm getting rid of this. And that mindset says, okay, if, if, if I have hatred, I'm going to nail that hatred to the cross. I'm going to get rid of it. I'm going to kill that hatred so that it doesn't control me anymore. And that's one way to look at that, that part of scripture in that verse is I am going to deliberately put that to death. I'm sentencing it to death and I'm not going to let it control me anymore. Verse 25. And I know we're, we're tight on time here. Uh, Since we live by the spirit, let us keep in step with the spirit. So that I wrote for you is a goal. Um, One way to look at this is you look in the mirror and say, who is going to lead today? Who's going to lead today? Um, Katie and I took some dance lessons uh, before uh, Amanda's wedding, and uh, it didn't do me a lot of good. Uh, But anyway, um, you know, sometimes we would laugh because we'd be dancing And the instructor would say, you're not leading to me. And then other times she would say to Katie, no, he's supposed to lead. So you have to ask yourself the question every day, who is going to lead me today? My goal is to keep in step with God's spirit. And to keep in step means who's leading? The Holy Spirit's leading. And that's a call that you have to make every day. You have to make that choice. And then in verse 26, it's just a little reminder, and that's why I put the frowny face there. Paul ends his, this chapter with, let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Um, even godly people can act ungodly. And I am the greatest example of that. And so we all have to be careful, even as people of faith. We can act like people without faith. And so Paul kind of ends this chapter with the way we really began in Pastor Larry's lesson today. And that is, if we're going to keep in step with the Spirit, we have to allow the Spirit to lead. And then we can follow the Spirit of God. Remember, condemnation is not of God. Conviction is of God. The Holy Spirit desires to show us where we need to change. We are always worthwhile. We always have hope. We always have help in Jesus Christ himself.
Let's end in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you that you give us hope. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, that's what some of us were. But by you, we have a new title, a new definition. We may still fall prone to sin and we may still be sinners. But at the same time, Lord, we have hope. We have help. We have Jesus Christ in our lives. Let us keep step with the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week. Thank you so much. Blessings to you. Take care. Bye-bye. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thanks.